Okay, hi everybody, welcome to uh, our session on Friday afternoon, the first of a double header today on uh, some microeconomics. The paper is fast approaching, Thursday is paper one. So I've chosen two topics that I think are absolutely super important for your exams. I can honestly say this without fear of contradiction, that if you include concepts related to government failure, to economic efficiency, and also to welfare in your analysis and evaluation, you will get better marks on your paper your paper one. So hopefully you can join us for this. If you're on the live chat, make sure you're subscribed and then you can add your thoughts, your ideas, your questions. And as always, I've got my professional producer pretty close by posting onto the screen some of the top answers. Can't guarantee you put every answer up, but we do our best to spread the joy a little bit. If you're watching on replay, then take a moment whenever you need to press the pause button, have a go at some questions and uh, let's see how we go. Today's topic is government failure. And then in the next session, we'll do a session on economic efficiency. So here we go. Let's uh, make a start with our first one. So just want a little bit of introduction. All markets fail. They just do. Okay. All real markets fail. Product markets, uh, labor markets for sure. And also you may well have covered financial market failure as part of your studies. Now, if markets are not self-correcting, self-equilibrating, markets are not efficient in allocating scarce resources, then there is a case for government intervention. Let's be clear, if markets fail, there is a case for intervention. The question then becomes what types of intervention work, what types of interventions are efficient, effective, equitable, uh, and of course, um, intervention can come in different guises, different uh, options, some affecting supply, some affecting demand. But with any intervention, and we'll look at three examples in this session, there's always the risk of government failure. I would be using phrases like there might be one or more government failures as opposed to there will be. So if you believe in intervention, then you might be a little bit glass half full on this, but just use hedging hedging words. Okay, here we go with um, 
our first uh, little explanation. Apologies for the couple of pings there. People are messaging me on their website. Have you got 60 seconds? What is your best definition, please, of government failure? Thank you. Okay, Robbie's answer is on the screen here. Lots of great answers coming through, as always. Thank you. Um, Bobby says it's when a, an intervention in the market does not have the desired impact. Yes, and, and leads to a more inequitable market outcome. That's a really key one there. Uh, and this talks about when government intervention uh, can lead to unintended consequences, such as the illegal sale of substances in shadow markets, black markets, secondary markets. That's really, really good. Um, just answering a couple of questions that came through. What kind of barber do I have my own barber? The answer is yes, I have my own hairdresser, in case you're asking. In fact, he charged me £10 last week for a haircut, plus a £400 search fee. Here's my answer coming up on the screen. Uh, intervention, government failures, when intervention to correct one or more market failures, often there's multiple market failures, leads to a greater net social welfare loss. Your answers were brilliant. I would just put in that net social welfare loss. So the cost of intervention might exceed the benefits in some shape or form. And an and intervention, the government failure can also happen when just policy just doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't achieve the objectives, in which case you might need a different policy or a, a combination of policies. Uh, okay, so um, just by way of illustration, moving on to the next slide. Uh, there are many causes of government failure. What we're going to try and do in this session, this short session, I've got three little mini case studies for you, and you're going to try and pick out some examples of government failure. Well, hopefully you've been through these. Um, the one on the top left is what we can almost split it up. Inequality. So is rising inequality a cause of government failure? It depends. It depends on your value judgment. Uh, it depends on what you, know, what you think an appropriate social optimal level of inequality of income and wealth should be. But to most economists, high levels of inequality are both a cause of market failure and a, often a consequence of government intervention. The regulatory capture we'll come to in a second. That's a key one. We're going to focus on that. The failure to rigorously test a policy, failure to do due diligence, to do cost benefit analysis on a particular intervention. High enforcement costs, compliance costs. Uh, and uh, one that a lot of people actually mentioned in the uh, chat there, the unintended consequences of policy. Most policies have at least one unintended consequence that have not been modelled. And this is super important. AQA, Edexcel, OCR, very important. Failure can happen when one policy, policy X, maybe, maybe works, but then conflicts with other policy aims. Let's see if we can get a few examples in the next few minutes. Tony asks, is this microeconomics? Yes, Tony. You're in the right building. Okay, here we go. So let's look at uh, the next question. Have a go, please. 60 seconds. What is regulatory capture? Have a go.
Yeah, some super, super answers coming through. His tears answer the actions of my interest groups uh, when successful, influencing uh, the staff or commission members of the regulators. In other words, uh, what can happen there is that the, the government tends to side or the regulatory agency tends to side a little bit more with corporate rather than consumer interests. His is a great point. When a regulator attempts to regulate a firm, however, the firm gains control or influence due to the firm being so powerful and regulation is unsuccessful. Roxy has a great point about stakeholder conflict. So when firms become so influential, so clearly significant, like, a, like Uber or Amazon, they gain control of the regulatory bodies, regulatory bodies sorry, causing stakeholder conflict. Loads of loads of great answers coming through. Ollie and Gracie had really good answers as well. Here's my, here's my attempt to capture the essence of the argument for you. It happens when regulatory agencies become sympathetic to the commercial interest of the regulated industry. So in other words, that can be the expense of the consumer. Those of you who do politics, and as many of you do, that can be the result of intense lobbying by corporations. It's often the result, by the way, that people who work for a corporation end up working for the regulator. So they, in the sense that they have that term, asymmetry, or if you want a technical term, an asymmetry of influence leading to regulators making decisions which are not in the consumer's best interest. Roxy's tearing up. I think we can all understand what a big moment that is for, for Roxy in this, in this tutor to you collective. Lobbying, Rack says, what's lobbying? Lobbying is basically where you lobby or trying to influence, negotiate with a uh, regulator to try and achieve something in your interest. A couple of good examples, the water industry, uh, the NASDAQ's water sector there, off, off what is not particularly powerful, uh, off gem, the energy industry, in terms of its regulatory, potential regulatory capture. Uh, yeah, we're, we're missing George. We need to ask to George. Now, a lot of schools have finished today. Maybe George finished at lunchtime. And George went out for a Nando's or something uh, and hasn't quite yet come back. Random stuff. I just got back from the gym. Five minutes ago, I was benching 150 kg. Wow. Well, random stuff. Congratulations. But I'm afraid I can do better than that because I, I can do 151. One, so you've got a little bit of extra work to do there during the exam period. Okay, here we go. Uh, the Riddler, I think, was in the building. Here we go. Let's, if it's okay with you, just three very quick examples, just to give a feel and a flavor for the exam. Let's take steel, first of all. I don't know if you know this, but post-Brexit, the UK does now impose a 25% tax on steel. Not every type of steel, but most types of steel. There's also a quota. Now, some people argue that this is important, that protectionism post-Brexit in a world where steel prices are falling. Others are critical of the steel tariff. So here's my challenge. Here's my question for you. Coming up on the screen, can you give me two possible government failures from the UK government imposing a quota and a tariff you can choose on imported steel. Have a go, please. Yeah, Georgia brings in a nice point there about the risk of retaliation, which I'm actually touch on in a second, George. Thanks for that point. Uh, lots of great answers. By the way, people saying is this, this is macro. A couple of people saying this is macro. It is, in a way, tariffs and quotas, but of course, it's one industry, isn't it? So, TS, increased cost of production for UK firms importing steel. Ah, yes, that may make workers redundant, reducing domestic employment. Excellent point. I'll, I'll, I'll emphasize that in a second with my answer. Robbie, well, a great answer, uh, Robbie. As you'd expect, one of Dylan's mates, there could be less affordable housing. It's a private joke, by the way. There could be less affordable housing built with the steel as it would be unprofitable to do so. This contradicts government aims to help build more homes. That is, Bobby, that is an outstanding point. It's bizarrely similar to the point I'm about to make in my thoughts. Well, here's my thoughts. I mean, is that one of the best points we've ever seen on, the, on a live chat? A couple of points, really important. 
if you impose a tariff or quota, clearly it's going to increase costs, what we call downstream users of steel, construction industry, car makers, etc. So, for example, a tariff on steel benefits steel production, production, but might make housing more expensive to build, which then makes housing less affordable. And that's an unintended consequence. Or e-vehicles become a little bit more expensive than they might be. And I think it was a really good point um, about the, uh, the trade retaliation. Tit for tat. If you put a tariff on my good, I put a tariff on yours. As a result, other export sectors might suffer. And, of course, you could bring in a little bit of game theory there if you really, really, really wanted to. Superb. Now, can you visualize in your mind, everybody, I ask all of you in the live chat, please, to take a moment to close your eyes. Can we all close our eyes, please? And I'm not going to move on to the next slide until everybody has closed their eyes. Right now, Jim's done it already. Can you visualize the tariff diagram? Open your eyes. This is the tariff diagram. So this is the diagram you would use. And of course, the really top students here would probably label the areas and pick out a deadweight welfare loss of welfare. I haven't done that for you. But clearly, tariffs have the potential for government failure. Bring that concept into play, maybe on the macro paper on, on the 22nd or in the synoptic paper. But bring government failure into your answer. You will get the credit. Next challenge, that's the first one I said. I had three little case studies for you in the time together. Next one, let's go north of the border to the wonderful country of Scotland. Scottish Government, uh, last year, just before that, introduced a rent increase cap. Essentially, they decided to cap the cost of rented property, including uh, student halls of residence. So they weren't allowed to increase rents. I think this year they've allowed it to go up by maybe 3%, but in real terms, obviously, that's a cut. So basically, the Scottish Government's brought in rent controls. Uh, meaning that landlords cannot increase their rent. Okay, so essentially a freeze in rent. Over to you, over to you. Can you please give me two possible government failures from this policy? Uh, instead of 60 seconds, I'm going to give you a full minute this time. Lots of great points there from Malachi, from TS, from Matt Campbell, from Tara, uh, from Jacob. Here's one from Kelsey. Landlords exiting the market, leading to a deeper shortage, a deeper market failure in housing and increasing house prices affecting affordability. Yeah, this is one of those, well, it's not, not guaranteed, but rent controls are in the news at the moment. The cost of renting, cost of buying, are rent controls an appropriate policy? Really good stuff. Uh, Millie talks about lower standards of living conditions. Yeah, that can have impact on health and well-being of workers. Hinting there, Miller's answer hints at externalities, doesn't it? You could then build an answer around the fact that we all then pay the higher costs of people living in damp housing, a fall in education, attainment, etc. A lot of people saying about shadow markets developing, if you're trying to force or hold the rent down, then the official rent is frozen, but of course, unofficially, people may well pay more in different ways, things like key money and, and other payments. Here are my answers. Again, conscious of time, everybody is uh, super time stressed at the moment. So the possible exit of landlords from the market due to subnormal profits. Of course, if you freeze the rent, but costs have gone up, it may make uh, landlords return on capital fall below zero. In other words, they may make a loss on their profits, subnormal profits. And if they then take pro uh, property off the market, supply falls, the shortage gets bigger. And of course, that and this is the government failure. It deepens the existing market failure. So that's the point that was made right at the start of our session. Government failure is when the market failure can actually get worse. And there's a lovely point, quite a few of you making points about the fact that landlords won't spend as much money on replacing boilers, uh, you know, installing um, insulation, improving insulation. So you get damp housing, you get energy inefficient housing. So the quality of the housing stock goes down. 
Um, and therefore, as a result, you might miss your carbon emissions targets, your net zero targets, policy conflict. Hashim says, can you argue government revenue will fall due to black markets? Yes, uh, in a sense, because a lot of the revenue will be non-taxed. So that would be a really nice unintended con consequence, Hashim. Is the shadow market the same as the black market? Yes, it is. Most students use shadow markets these days or informal or secondary markets when describing it. But don't worry too much. You won't get penalised for that. Superb. That's the second one. Can I finish with our... Th oh, sorry, before we do that, here's the diagram. I just want to show the diagram, yes. Uh, advice here. Uh, you could draw cost and revenue curve stuff if you wanted to, but I'm just using supply and demand. Uh, again, you need to cap the rent below the equilibrium, R2, uh, and of course that creates excess demand. Again, I haven't labeled everything here, but I have drawn the demand and the supply curves to cut the Y axis. That then does allow you to talk about consumer and producer surplus that lifts your level of analysis. Okay. Uh, and the, the next slide just simply just develops the diagram, to show what happens if uh, landlords leave the market, exit of landlords. And as the supply shifts to S2 and at the R2 cap, it makes the excess demand, the shortage, even bigger. And if you want to think about this, you might want to think about the areas, the impact of consumer surplus, and what's a tiny level of producer surplus. CJ418 says that haircut is worth way more than £10. Well, that's true. It really is. So I got some consumer surplus from it because I was willing to pay about £12. So £2 consumer surplus isn't bad at all. Okay, let's move on to our third, I think, our third and final Example, I've just tried to choose three topical examples. Hopefully you found them useful. Now, energy drinks. By the way, that can is actual size in that picture. It's actual size. Just thought I'd mention that. These are the most well-known energy drinks in the UK. 93% of people recognize the brand Red Bull. Okay? Uh, which makes the question, what have the other 7% of people do, been doing in, in recent times? Monsters up there, LucasAid. I mean, do, do you people drink? These energy drinks, I occasionally might have one when I'm driving. Um, interestingly, I just literally today, we went at school, they, we gave our, um, yeah, there you go, thieves who steal packets of energy drinks, how do they sleep at night? A great answer, great joke, to you. Uh, we, had a, we had a talk today on the impact of sleep deprivation on revision. And I tell you what, it was a powerful talk. In fact, it was a massive wake-up call for me. So there's the issue. The issue of the next slide gives you a little bit of uh, of background that the young people in the UK apparently are the second biggest consumers of high caffeine energy drinks for their age. OK, Red Bull, Monster Relentless, Prime, of course, hit the shelves last year, wasn't it? And sold out because of herd effects in the UK. It's not illegal to sell energy drinks below the age of 16, but supermarkets can opt into that. They can say we won't serve you. Poland just yesterday brought in a, an act banning the sale of these drinks to under 18s. That's the reason why I've chosen the topic. I just think it's one of those interesting topics. So should there be a ban or should we do something else? Here's, I've got two more questions for you to finish with. Can you again, in the chat window, fantastic answers today, give me two examples of possible government failure from saying, well, we're going to ban high caffeine drinks to anybody under the age of 16. Have a go. There we go. Some great answers coming through. Those of you watching live, just check out the chat. Uh, some superb answers. Paul Ace, does that mean you're Ace of Politics? Anyway, Paul Ace talks about ineffective consumption control 
banning high caffeine drinks may fail to, and that, by the way, I love this phrase. This is outstanding. May fail to address the root causes, the underlying causes of excessive consumption, leading to a shift towards other unhealthy behaviors or substances. That is high quality evaluation. If you wrote that in the exam, you'd be absolutely superb, especially if you could support it maybe with a demerit good diagram or an externalities diagram. That would be terrific. Uh, just a word for Bruno Pagano. Bruno Pagano is now in the building. This is good news. Uh, we still haven't found George Bulldog, but the Riddler is here. And here's Bruno's point. Regressive impact on the lowest earners, increasing income inequality. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure how many. Yeah, it's possibly, possibly. Low, low income families with a lot of teenagers, possibly. Uh, yeah, a lost revenue. A lot of people talking about a lot of people, the impact on um, employment for small retailers. Tara's point, less VAT revenue and energy drinks leads to a lower tax revenue for the government. Absolutely. Malachi's got a good point about often the inelastic due to habitual consumption. And Christian talks saying kids at school will sell privately. They probably will do at my school. Polles comes in. This is he's on fire. He or she is on fire. Dead weight loss. Here we go. A ban may create inefficiencies as the cost of enforcement. Reduce consumer surplus and negative effects on business outweigh the benefits of reduced caffeine consumption. If Carlsberg did answers on government failure, that will be the answer they would give. Here's my answers very quickly, conscious of time. Here we go. Yep, shadow markets, black markets, prohibiting the sale may create shadow markets where these beverages are sold illegally at high prices. Um, whatever, you know, Bruno's got a stock of these drinks and he'll sell them to you for a a tidy price enforcement costs enforcing a ban can be very expensive who's going to police this who's going to regulate it uh do inf extra cost on small retailers by the way small retailers are about five foot five maybe a bit, bit smaller failure to impose the ban would make it less effective and critically a ban does not address the uh underlying reasons for uh, people drinking these things, you know, information gaps, uh, lack of parental guidance, etc. A lot of people talk about the nanny state with a ban. Well, that's right. And this is this is where value judgments come in. To what extent should we? So, for example, they've banned tanning salons from the 16s and uh, various other things. Poland has just put in an under 18 ban. Uh, wow. One more question. So last one. Instead of uh, banning it, how about this one? Let's just tilt it right to the end possible causes of government failure from imposing a minimum price for these drinks. Not a ban, but a minimum price. Have a go. <laughs> yeah, I think Kiki came in with very, very succinct uh, two answers, went, went uh, double double two answers, and really I think captures the essence of why minimum prices often don't work. Uh, the reason for choosing this topic, by the way, of course, is that Scotland brought in a minimum price for alcohol. And that's uh, there's now quite a bit of evidence about the consequences of that. Um, here's Kiki's point of aggressive, comma, inelastic demand. Well, that's a classic uh, where you could build an answer there. Uh, it talks about black market use and shadow markets, etc. Uh, some good answers, some really, really good answers coming through in the chat window. Sometimes, by the way, the answers come through a little bit delayed, so we may not mention your name. But we really appreciate you contributing. It makes a huge difference to the... Uh, to the session uh what have we got here tara says it may not actually work yes energy drinks are addictive therefore the price you'll assist you on fairly low and therefore you need to set a pretty high minimum price to have a significant effect on demand which is excellent and again uh, excess supply yep namo c a new contributor here demand is likely to be price inelastic due to addiction suppliers may try to reconstitute products to pass regulations that's possible. I don't think they'd be allowed to make the product less healthy. 
um, they better do when they do it with the sugar tax. So, for example, you set a minimum price based on how much caffeine there is in the drink. And some producers might decide to reduce the caffeine content to bypass the minimum legislation. In a way, that's working, isn't it? Because you're getting the caffeine content down. It does make it a little bit less, less effective. Uh, yeah, here we go. Here's my two points. Low price elasticity, low effectiveness. Uh, it would take a very high minimum price to have a substantial impact, which then might have a regressive effect. A couple of people said progressive. I think it's regressive, isn't it? If low-income families have lots of teenage kids, depends on their spending patterns, but it would be regressive if you had a high minimum price. Georgina, for example, talks about distortion of price signals, which is a nice generic point, really good point. And substitution effects. Improving a minimum price on high caffeine drinks may lead to unintended substitution effects so people might shift to for example look, i'm no expert on this but they might shift to i don't know those kind of caffeine tablets which you pop into some water or something you get some sort of fizzy effect i call them my lesson today i call them chewy things well you get the idea so those people will just stop drinking drinks they'll find their caffeine fix they'll drink more they'll ask for an extra shot at cost or something or whatever there's no guarantee that this policy would be effective and as a result um there's a possible government failure. Apollos, let's finish with Apollos if we can. And a lot of people asking Apollos not to take the exam next week so that the grade boundaries come down. Prices may not reflect the true equilibrium value determined by supply and demand. So imposing a minimum price could create an artificial price floor, which could lead to reduced competition. It would certainly have quite a big effect, I think, on small, small retailers who rely on a lot of these drinks. Can I just finish with a diagram? A lot of you talk about elasticity. So again, you definitely use supply and demand. Um, the, the aim is not, by the way, to encourage production. So the aim is to reduce demand. So there's P1 is the equilibrium, drive it up to the minimum price, whatever that happens to be. We are hoping that that will reduce consumption. But of course, if demand is price inelastic, you don't get much of an effect. Whereas the next slide shows you what happens if you have a more elastic demand. Now, what you could do, maybe what I should have done, is put those two on the same diagram. So you could draw an inelastic demand and an elastic demand. And therefore, Jim's very kindly, this is Billy. Jim's had his, some training with Pixar today. And you can see here, if we change the elasticity, we get a different effect for the same minimum price. There we go. That's our half an hour up. I need to put some more money in the meter. I'm doing another session at 5.30 on super important economic efficiency, economic welfare. I'm here to tell you now that students who use those concepts in the exam next week will be in a much, much better place. So if you want to join me for that, even tell you, try and find a friend. Can you find a friend? Does Bruno Pagano have a friend? Does Robbie Thompson have a friend? You might want to join in at 5.30. Well, let's find out and let's see how things go. Huge thanks for joining in. We're doing a double header today, two different topics. Some great answers on government failure. Hope you found that was useful. If you did, press the like button. If you didn't, press the like button. Uh, but for now, and if you want to see, maybe see you in half an hour's time, um, let's see how many people we can get in half an hour's time. Let's set the Tutor to Collective a target. Try and get at least another five people in half an hour's time. But for now, stay happy, stay curious, stay healthy. See you soon.